Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Welcome to our first Jackson College Symposium on the U.S. Constitution. Every year we attempt to celebrate the original signing of the Constitution of the United States, which happened on September 17th, 1787, 229 years ago. In the past, we've done a number of different things uh, here at the school. We've had voter registration drives, political debates, things of that nature. And this year we decided to hold a symposium. You might be wondering, what is a symposium? Well, I've been able to find at least three definitions. They are A, a conference or meeting to discuss a particular subject. B, a collection of essays or papers on a particular subject by a number of contributors. And C, one of my favorite definitions, a drinking party or convivial discussion as held in ancient Greece after banquet and notable as the title of the work by Plato. Obviously, we're not serving any alcohol to anyone today, so I guess that rules out the third definition. I'd like to begin by introducing our panel. I'm starting the closest to me and working my Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Welcome to our first Jackson College Symposium on the U.S. Constitution. Every year we attempt to celebrate the original signing of the Constitution of the United States, which happened on September 17th, 1787, 229 years ago. In the past we've done a number of different things uh, here at the school. We've had voter registration drives, political debates, things of that nature. And this year we decided to hold a symposium. You might be wondering, what is a symposium? Well, I've been able to find at least three definitions. They are A, a conference or meeting to discuss a particular subject. B, a collection of essays or papers on a particular subject by a number of contributors. And C, one of my favorite definitions, a drinking party or convivial discussion as held in ancient Greece after banquet and notable as the title of the work by Plato. Obviously, we're not serving any alcohol to anyone today, so I guess that rules out third definition. I'd like to begin by introducing our panel. I'm starting the closest to me and working my way down. Uh, we have um, Dr. Ted Miller, a member of our faculty. Uh, Kayla Nodine is a, a student at Jackson College and also a member of our JCLISD Academy. Get that correct? Right. Shereen Thames, professor in the political science, member of our faculty. Uh, Nathan Hiss, uh, one of our students here at Jackson College and also a member of our American Honors Program. Uh, our, one of our professors in psychology, Nabiha Zakir. Uh, Billy Walton is a student at, uh, in Jackson College at Adrian. And you must be Mercedes Sorensen. Hi, Mercedes. We haven't met, so now we're meeting. All right. And what we're going to do this afternoon is uh, address the question and pass the microphone down to each of the panelists. I want to take this opportunity to thank each of you for your participation today, for taking the time out of your busy schedule and uh, to join with us today. I'd like to begin, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, to ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Thus begins the preamble of our Constitution. It is followed by seven articles addressing structure and function of our unique form of government. It is a relatively short document and can be easily read in one comfortable city. However, in order to gain the approval of the diverse and distinct colonies which have now become states, the writers of this document soon realized that, as written, it was insufficient. It had to go further to protect certain rights of our nation's citizens, rights that were determined to be essential to the functioning of a democracy. This activity led to the construction 
of the first 10 amendments known today as the Bill of Rights. And with the passage of time, the list of amendments has grown. Currently, there are 27 covering a wide variety of topics critically important to our people. Today, our focus is the First Amendment, which reads as follows. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people to peaceably assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. And that brings us to today's symposium. The question posed to each of our panelists is rather simple, but hopefully meaningful and worthy of our time and energy. What does the First Amendment mean to me? So let's begin with, I see one of my students. Guess what? Guess what you get the opportunity to do because you're last? You get to go first. All right. So look what you have a seat right here. And this is Aaliyah Martin. Another Jackson College student and also a member of our American Honors program. So, will we? Is the anxiety building, Leah? No. No, good. All right. So, you're first up, all right? So, here's the mic, and when you're done, you just pass it on. Okay. In order to describe what the First Amendment means to me, I must first determine what exactly is the First Amendment. The First Amendment is one of the ten amendments included in the Bill of Rights, which went into effect on December 15, 1791. The First Amendment was written because, at America's inception, citizens wanted a guarantee of their basic freedoms. It was written by James Madison in 1789. The First Amendment states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging, abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. In retrospect, this means the government cannot restrict religion, speech, press, newspapers, blog, etc., protesting or petitioning. To me, these basic freedoms shape the base of the entire American culture. This means that everything that Americans can do is because we have the right to. For example, in other countries, going against what the government says will result in death. Here in America, we can protest by, peace, by peaceful demonstration or even by rallying together to form a petition. The First Amendment means that you have the right to think what you think, to believe what you believe, to value your opinion whenever and however, as long as you don't disturb the peace. The First Amendment contributes to a lot of our everyday, li everyday lives. Being able to watch the news, the news reports, being able to report, social media, being able to post thoughts and feelings, going to church to practice the various religions that exist in America, without the First Amendment, our normal lives would not be the same. Personally, the First Amendment means a lot. My career of choice is to be a civil rights lawyer or activist. Without the First Amendment, my dream would be impossible. In fact, I would be in danger of voicing my opinions. I think the First Amendment was, the, was one of the best pieces of laws ever written. The ideas are so small yet so valuable to the American culture, community, and civilization. It provides basic rights that are often taken for granted because of the fact that they have now become a part of our common sense understanding. However, that was not always the case. Opposing religions were frowned upon and often are gave certain people unfair advantages as well as disadvantages. It was hard to determine what was allowed and what was prohibited because nothing ever clearly stated so. Although the First Amendment might almost seem remedial and repetitive, it is completely necessary for our civilization. Could you imagine having to watch everything you say or do, or having to suppress your true feelings because they didn't conform to society? I couldn't. Realistically, a life as such would be unpurposeful. Our thoughts, feelings, actions, and beliefs make us all unique and different. Essentially, our differences is what makes America, America. Our freedoms are why people immigrate here for opportunities. Without the basic rights stated in the First Amendment, our society would not be the same. Good afternoon. Uh, so I think Anthony invited me to participate in this symposium for one reason, uh, I'm a practicing Buddhist. I became a Buddhist uh, when I was a teenager. And so uh, this, thinking about this symposium, what I was going to say today, kind of gave me an uh, opportunity to, to reflect on uh, the, the fact that I can practice this very minority, not a lot of Buddhists around here, especially in Jackson, uh, freely. And um, so it means a lot to me, and I was thinking about some times in, in my life when I have exercised that right. And uh, one of them was when I turned 18, 
the United States was in war uh, in Vietnam, and we were uh, required to register with the Selective Service, which I did. And as a, as a Buddhist, I really oppose war. I really oppose uh, violence as a means for resolving conflict. Uh, so I registered as a conscientious objector, meaning that uh, I, don't, I would not uh, pick up a gun and, and kill someone, uh, even if instructed to do so. So that was a right. More recently, in uh, 2003, we went to war again, this time in Iraq, and I was very much opposed to that war. I see some uh, folks here who were also uh, with, with me on that one. And so there was a group of us in Jackson, uh, some Buddhists and some other uh, folks from other religions, we formed the Interfaith, Jackson Interfaith Peacekeepers, and we, we protested. This was before uh, we launched that war. We protested, we got together, and we, we held up signs and said, don't do this, don't go into war. Um, and then we actually uh, had speakers come and talk about peace as an alternative. Um, and one of those speakers was actually your time's up. Um, one of those speakers was uh, one of the founders of a group called Iraq Veterans Against the War. So it was somebody who, uh, who went and fought in Iraq, didn't like what he saw, and, and came back and started an organization saying we should not be in this war. So that was a pretty controversial person to bring to campus. And I know that uh, uh, there were there was some discomfort with having that speaker come here, but, but Alex Ryaboff came, he gave a wonderful talk. And uh, during, that, uh, during that event, uh, a fellow colleague, uh, a colleague who is from Romania, leaned over and she asked me, how did you do this? You know, how did you bring this speaker? You know, and, and, and I said, you know, I did, it's, it's all right. Um, so, I belong to a Japanese school of Buddhism, and uh, the, the Japanese organization is called Soka Gakkai, and it's a, it's a group that was very, uh, <clears throat> very outspoken against the Pacific War, the war between Japan and the United States. And in 1943, uh, they were arrested, the, the two, uh, several of the leaders of the organization were arrested, put in prison, one of them died in prison. Uh, because they were exercising their religious, uh, what, what we consider their religious right to, to speak out against uh, the state uh, imposed Shinto religion. And um, then following the war, the United States uh, became the occupational government and they demanded, they declared freedom of religion. And so my organization, the Soka Gakkai, was able to then flourish. And so at that time, the members were really grateful for the United States for allowing that uh, freedom to take place. So I want to just uh, conclude by mentioning some quibbles that I have, personally as a, pra a practitioner of a minority religion, and that is that in some uh, local government uh, functions, they begin with a Christian prayer. And that presumes that um, because the majority of people are Christians, that's okay. And actually, it might not be okay. It might not be comfortable for some people. Or to put your hand on the Bible in court and, uh, and say, you know, respond, I, I, you know, I promise to help me God. Um, and so I, I think that we always have opportunities to go back to the spirit of the uh, First Amendment of the Constitution, Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, the term uh, one nation under God, the term under God was added in the 50s as a response to the, the communist scare, the red scare. People wanted to have people declare that they, you know, uh, pledge allegiance to the flag uh, in one nation under God to distinguish those that might not uh, uh, fit in with what people felt was the correct way to believe. So the spirit of the Constitution is that the, we can't be forced uh, to believe one way or another. So uh, I'll leave you with that thought, and maybe after following uh, the presentations, we can have some discussion about those kinds of issues. Thanks. Hi. Um, to me, the First Amendment is the fine line separating America from other countries around the world. Um, it's the part of the Constitution that pretty much stamps like a protective symbol over our rights as American citizens. It means that not only do I have the freedom to grant it to me by being 
an American citizen. But it also means that no matter who is elected or what goes on through the government, that those cannot be taken away from me. Um, it means that my generation, because I'm a part of a newer generation, um, generations to come and generations after that are all going to have the same opportunities and same rights that every human being should be granted. Um, the First Amendment, in my opinion, provides people with like peace of mind. Because in some other countries, you have to, people are scared that government people can just walk in their homes and arrest them. And we don't have that here in America. We have the comfort knowing that we can voice our opinions and we can express our religious views and we can protest against things we don't see fit for our communities. And we aren't scared of being punished for that. Um, for, okay. for me, the first, I don't know if you guys have ever read the book The Giver, but the First Amendment means that we will never live in a community like that, which is an authoritarian, like, the people didn't have any choice, they were put into a group and that's where they stayed. And it means to me that we are always going to have the freedom. Um, hello, and thank you, Tony, for organizing this. Um, it's a great opportunity for all of us who work together many years to learn more about each other. Um, with regard to the First Amendment, there were so many pieces that resonated with me, and I debated back and forth of which, which slice to choose, um, and I, I concur with um, Ted that the, the opportunity to practice um, whatever religion we wish is so powerful. Um, and then a layer even deeper is within a religion to have so many different expressions um, and interpretations of that religion, which doesn't always happen um, as well. So I think that's a powerful aspect of the First Amendment. Um, the part that I chose to um, think more deeply about was actually freedom of the press. And that came about because I wound up choosing this career because I loved learning. Uh, that was the, the driving force of how um, I wound up wanting to actually become a teacher. And to me, um, and this is what we talk about a lot in the classroom, um, so if we don't realize the power of the media, think about it this way. Everything that you know that you have not personally experienced, you know because somebody else told you. And that can come in any number of forms. Um, but for most of us, we've experienced this much, and we know this much, or think we know this much. And so a huge, huge place um, where information comes to us is through the media. And as someone who loves learning and believes so much in the power of education, um, I come back to this role of the media so often, and how it's changed, actually, over the last number of years. Um, particularly the online environment. So I'm going to do a quick poll. How many of you get your news from um, the internet in some way, shape, or form? Okay. Um, how many of you from television? Okay. And how many from the newspaper? Basically, okay. I have the newspapers online. Oh, Martha, you're always so good at figuring out the details. Exactly. Um, and that's, that's exactly the question that bridges us to um, having to think really hard about where we get the media. So um, I have a few quibbles too, good word. Um, just some things to throw out, to think about in terms of um, being an active consumer of how you learn. So one of the realities that's occurred, and I think the internet is one of the most incredible inventions of my lifetime, it still amazes me. Um, but we live in a world now where we, anybody can, with a few clicks, find information that completely supports everything that they believe. Their values, what they want to believe about the world, and what they want to believe about other people. And that's really comfortable, um, and it can feel good, but it's really dangerous from a learning perspective. And since 1985, the federal government has stopped enforcing what's called the Fairness Doctrine, which meant that television was required to present two sides of an issue. Um, good news versus do, um, but very often we can, again, turn on the television in some cases and hear support for the worldview that we have. Um, and so I share those concerns, um, those quibbles, because again, if we believe uh, in learning and we are a democracy,
democracy um, that literally selects the next leaders, not only of this country, but of the world, um, because of the position of the United States, is so critical that we think about where we get our information um, and that it is as accurate as possible. Um, and I'll leave you with that final thought. Um, if you sort of travel around the world or you talk to people from other parts of the world, uh, they will regularly ask, and it's not a new question, but it has a new heightened um, kind of emotion to it now. They'll say, do Americans really understand that they are going to not only elect the next president of the United States, they are going to elect the next person who will be a major world leader. And we can't vote for that person, but we will be a part of the consequences of that choice. And that is not to put um, the hand on one side of a candidate or another. That has been the reality for decades and decades and decades since the US assumed the position of a superpower after World War II. Um, but I think sometimes we forget that. We, we stay sort of between two oceans, but we're part of a world. Um, and sometimes for many people, the only window to that world um, is the media in some way, shape, or form. So um, it's a huge responsibility, and it's a big world, and it's very complicated. And I think it behooves us to do the best that we can uh, to really learn about it well. Um, so I have a handout. At the end, I'm happy to pass out students always ask me, so where can I go um, to learn uh, about the world and, and at least see several perspectives. So, um, and fact checking. There's great fact checking websites too. Um, so I can, I'm happy to share that. But those are some of the thoughts that went through my mind um, on the federal office moment. My name is Nathan Ness, and before I go into what, I, what the First Amendment means to me, I'm going to restate what Professor Cleveland said as to what I actually read. And it reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or of the right of the people to peacefully assemble, and to petition the government for redress of grievances. The main two points I'm going to focus on are freedom of religion and freedom of speech and press. First, I'll talk about the freedom of religion. As stated in the First Amendment, we all have the right and freedom to choose what religion we want to be a part of, and we also have the freedom to practice our religion in the public square, given that the practice won't break any other laws or cause danger to any others within that public square. The First Amendment also goes into the responsibility of the government to keep a neutral public square and prohibits the government from creating a governmentally established religion. Our government and its officials within our government must not pass or attempt to pass any laws that restrict any one or more religions from practicing their moral or religious values. That's something that's so important about America, is that we can practice our religious values to the freedom of our will. As an example, children or teenagers in public schools should not should be able to pray before their meals or worship in whatever way they want before before they eat, and that should not be withheld from them. On the other hand, students also should not be forced to accommodate any one religion over another. Overall, the government has its responsibility to keep the public square neutral by not favoring one religion over another. In regards to freedom of speech and of the press, we consider the two to be very closely related. Freedom of speech is protected by the First Amendment in a way that grants us people of the United States our freedom to do exactly what I'm doing right now is speaking my mind and my personal opinion. And secures our ability to do such things in, public, in the public square that are restricted from other parts of the world. The freedom of the press is very similar in that we are free to express our personal opinions and but to the public by means of any physical medium, whether it be a newspaper or perhaps a social media posting. As citizens of the United States of America, we have our freedom of speech and of the press protected, but that does not mean, however, that we should abuse those rights by intentionally trying to hurt or slander anyone in any way. We should not be harm we should not use harmful words against someone and try to excuse it by quoting the First Amendment and saying the First Amendment backs up these harmful words. Likewise, it is also our responsibility to do our best in not becoming offended by people simply expressing their personal opinion in exercising their freedom of speech. If you disagree with something that someone said, you can take it for what it is, and that's their personal opinion. Thank you.
Hey everyone, hope you guys have been having a great Wednesday today. Um, before I get into my spiel, I wanted to uh, further comment on what Shereen had mentioned. So, in addition to teaching, um, I do also do uh, conduct some research. And in research, uh, we call, she was mentioning, confirmation bias. Looking for something that supports your theory. And in research specifically, it's incredibly dangerous because the whole, the core of research and the intention of research is to bring about the truth. So it's not about who's right and who's wrong, it's about what the truth is. So you're not looking to confirm what you personally believe, and you have to be humble and accept that perhaps you could be wrong. Um, so I want to point that out, that in research we see that to be dangerous, um, so in reality in the real world as well. Now as for the First Amendment, um, you know, we had uh, you know, people read out what it was, um, and to me, I was thinking about how to comment on it. It took me a long time to figure out what I wanted to say. Uh, but I was talking to my husband about it, and he actually made uh, a few points. The first of which is that this, of all the numbers, it could be, right, of amendments. It's not Amendment 1765. It is the First Amendment. So this is the core of us being Americans. Say what we wish, the freedom of press, the freedom to rally against a government peacefully. This is the core of who we are as Americans. And in fact, I would personally argue that it's not even just an American value, but rather human rights. Here you have it on paper that this is what we believe every person should be allowed because that is our human right. At who we are as humans, just the humanity that we have, right? Just our ethics, our morals are telling us that every person should be allowed these freedoms. So it shouldn't mean, um, it shouldn't be allowed, it is a human right. So everyone should be able to do as they do, you know, speak their mind as they wish, uh, think as they do, and not fear and backlash. Um, and uh, I believe that's, that's something that has been um, becoming more and more, more problematic today. So a little bit of back information about me. Um, I'm not from Michigan. Uh, I was born and raised in New York. So I'm very used to that. a lot of diversity I have to make coming to Jackson. Was, it was a bit of a culture shock for me. Um, but in New York is where all of my family are, you know, most of my friends. I lived there all my life. I've only been in Michigan for about a year. And, um, you know, my friends and family are scared for their lives. And I don't think that that is appropriate. As a human, no human should be fearful of their lives. You know, we hear about the bombing in Chelsea. You should have seen my Facebook news feed. Every single status was everyone, please be careful out there. Please be careful. And some people were, were letting people know that, you know what, I don't think I'm going to go outside today because I don't know if it's safe for me. There are also comments all the time where, um, you know, as you can tell from my headscarf, I am a Muslim, right? Uh, where a lot of my friends and my family will post their, their thoughts and they'll be like, please, this last bombing or this last issue, whatever it was, don't let them be Muslim. Please, God, don't let them be Muslim. Because this, this fear, this hatred, comes around full circle, right? People who are fearful, fearful of those practicing in a particular way, then produces fear in those same people of everyone else and how they may perceive them. So I'm a very big proponent of peace, just like Dr. Miller. Um, and one of the things that I also attempted to teach my students um, you know, outside of religion, so I teach psychology, right? I don't, I don't teach world religion, is to bring about peace to the world. You know, everything that I teach in psychology, it can be applicable to yourself, it can be applicable to the relationships that you have, and better understanding those relationships. So having that understanding after the class, I don't care if they fail the class, I mean, I hope they don't, right? But my, my main concern is that they take that information that I teach and they bring it out to the world so that they can become better people and they can make the world a better place. Okay, so that's all I have to say. Hello, my name is Billy. This is what, this is what I believe that the First Amendment means to me. Having the language to discuss any context is a form of power. Expression exercises that power. Thus, the First Amendment represents the freedom to express my will, to relate, to influence, to help, to play. 
the right to communicate openly. It's simple and profound. The First Amendment is a genuine source of power and openness. However, the same things that make you laugh will make you cry. Free speech is also a predictor of grief. For instance, terrorists use the internet to radicalize and radicalize the socially and mentally desperate. Yet the First Amendment is the vehicle for us to know and dare to act against those forces. The power of the people large, long, <laughs> the power of the people lies largely in language expression. Free speech gives us the right to express our will for better or worse. Now I could segue to talking about how the First Amendment relates to social injustice in general, but there is a certain indignity in that because I simply don't know how to express it in five minutes. I do have time, however, to be specific. Free speech does allow all of us to fight, hopefully without violence. It seems obvious the merits of free speech, as if to make this symposium a gratuity, if you will, a feather in our American cap. The First Amendment is the ounce of prevention against repression. For example, when individuals repress things, they become psychologically unhealthy. They stop telling themselves the truth. They don't accept themselves for who they are as a process to maintain or develop a healthy lifestyle. I think nations behave similarly. When people of those nations become so politically correct, they stop telling the truth about how they think and feel. People continually leave that truth unexpressed, even though the Constitution allows it for good reason. For example, Donald Trump, <laughs> who has been denounced for warmongering and bigotry, I submit to you that the reason why he's gotten as far as he has is because he is expressing thoughts and feelings that represent a whole lot of people. People who are afraid they are losing what they value from their way of life. Political correctness would encourage those people to remain silent. I disagree because those people will still react in ways based on those thoughts, maybe unbeknownst to us, and that's really unhealthy. If you think about it, the First Amendment is a basic framework by which we can know each other without harming each other. And if you really get to know someone, it's hard to hate them. And since hate's like a disease, disease makes you sick. Weakness is the last thing. we need in this country right now because the world just simply isn't safe anymore. Respect is a good thing, but extreme political correctness reduces opportunities for meaningful conflict by preventing truth from being expressed. And that is the opposite of the First Amendment. The First Amendment is a beautiful instrument of law. May we all play it well together. That's what the First Amendment means to me. Before I begin, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Cleveland for inviting me here and uh, my fellow panel members for giving me the opportunity to listen about your views and opinions. Um, and secondly, to apologize for my voice, it's a bit sore. <clears throat> um, much like each of us, the United States has grown and developed greatly since birth. And every year on the 4th of July, we celebrate our separation and independence from Great Britain. But this past Friday, we celebrated the day that was just as important, which is the signing of our Constitution. In the First Amendment of this document, we pull some of our most basic rights. The freedom of speech and religion, the right to general assembly and free press, and the right to petition the government to reach us grievances. These are the building blocks of our society. We talk about how these rights are so basic and so ingrained in us as people that we often take them for granted in our everyday lives. I am proud to be a part of a society where this is even possible. I'm sorry, I picked up the next part. Um, I am proud to be a part of a society where this is even possible. Each and every one of these rights, regardless of how simple and how basic they may seem, is paramount to the, to the livelihood of hundreds of thousands of people's lives. We can look back in history and see an example where each one of these is key to the American life. The <clears throat> Mahatma Gandhi's salt march, the Holocaust, the Boston Massacre, the attempted censorship of the autobiography of Malcolm X, 
and the Great Potato Famine. The amount of people affected by these events is over 20 million. That's all of Australia. It's all of Syria, it's all of North Korea, and Chile, and the Netherlands. I am grateful to be part of a society where this is even possible to be taken for granted. I am grateful to be able to wake up every day with something that I know nobody can take from me. To me, the First Amendment is just every day. It's wonderful and amazing, and I'm grateful that I don't have to think about it every time I want to do something. To me, the First Amendment is inalienable. Thank you. Thank you. I also am going to try to answer this question, what does the First Amendment need to be? I, as a psychologist, I know that we live in the moment, but we are a product of our past. So this is not going to be a psychology lesson, but a short lesson in history. The year was 1685, a long time ago. The location was southwestern Scotland. Their names were Margaret Wilson and Thomas Cochran. They considered themselves to be covenanters. In other words, they had taken an oath, pledging all to what they considered to be the one true church, the Reformed Kirk of Scotland. Margaret and Thomas were what you and I would call Presbyterians. King Charles Stuart II sat on the throne in London. As monarch, he was King of England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, and the rest of the developing British Empire, including these British colonies here in North America. Like his father and grandfather before him, Charles firmly believed in the divine right of kings, the doctrine that kings derive their authority from God, and that rebellion against the king is a sin against the Almighty. And since the days of King Henry VIII, the British kings were considered head of church as well as state. Therefore, throughout his reign, Charles attempted to ensure that good and loyal subjects of the British crown were also faithful and tithing members of the Anglican church. As you might suspect, this did not go over well in a number of places throughout the empire. In particular, the southwestern section of Scotland, which eventually erupted in open rebellion against their king. Sadly, the story of Margaret and Thomas ends with their deaths. Thomas was hung by the neck until almost dead, and then his body was removed from the scaffold, placed upon a hard stone slab, where he was drawn and quartered. Margaret was executed by drowning in the incoming tide of the Solway Firth. These are just two examples of the hundreds, perhaps thousands, of men, women, and yes, even children, who died because of their faith between the years of 1680 and 1688, a period known by Scottish historians as the Killing Time. Those who remained loyal to the Covenant and who survived fled Scotland. A few immigrated to the continent, ending up in places like Amsterdam and Geneva. Many returned to their ancient Celtic homeland of Ulster in Northern Ireland, thinking they would be free of this tyrannical edict of the king. But that was not to be the case. They, like their Celtic cousins, the native Roman Catholic Irish, were subjected to tremendous discriminatory practices. And then they heard the call from William Penn of the colony of Pennsylvania. If you obey the laws of our land, you may come here, plant your crops, raise your families, and worship your God as you desire, free from harassment and intimidation. And they came by the boatloads. American historians estimate that somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 to 400,000 Ulster Scots made that arduous journey from the north of Ireland to the port of Philadelphia between the years 1715 and 1740. From Philadelphia, they migrated east to north into New York, New Jersey, and west up into the Allegheny Mountains. But many of them traveled south along the great Philadelphia wagon road into the back country of the colonies of Virginia the Carolinas. One or two generations later, they, along with other religious refugees from France and Germany, were asked by their fellow English-American colonists living along the Atlantic coast to take up long rifle and tomahawk and fight together against the tyrannical rule of King George III and his parliament. And fight they did. And of course, the entire world knows how that story ends. You see, they had tasted freedom, and it tasted sweet. So when it came time to create a document which would serve as a guide for the structure and function of this new country, these men and women who had experienced firsthand both the injustice of religious intolerance as well as inspirational religious freedom demanded of the founders words that to the effect would forever protect their right to worship, 
or not worship their God in peace. America is a great experiment in the history of our species. Lincoln captured the essence of our form of government when he stated, Our government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Those are powerful, meaningful words. We are not a perfect nation. Our past offers ample evidence of our flaws. We have made mistakes, some of them horrible mistakes, with long-lasting and negative consequences for the people of this country. But we, as a self-governed people, have made and continue to make progress, often learning valuable lessons from these mistakes. And I think, no, I firmly believe, as we remember our past, our future looks promising. As the Italian philosopher George Santayana once wrote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. In summation, then, this is my challenge to each of you. Remember our past. Take a few moments sometime today and think of those who have come before you. Think of their sacrifice. Think of what they have given so that you and I might enjoy this land of liberty and freedom. Thank you. So now I'd like to invite anybody from the audience to ask any questions of any members of the panelists, and hopefully somebody has something to say. Hang on, let me give you the mic. One of the things that kept arising from all of you, and by the way, I think we should give you all a hand right now. Because because um, you gave us the lens of which you view the First Amendment and how it matters in your personal lives. And so that was really a generous gift to all of us to express how that First Amendment touches you. One of the overarching themes that kept coming through to me was that this freedom of speech, or even all of the freedoms granted by the First Amendment, has or carries with it, at least as I was hearing you, a sense of responsibility. So speak, but not too much. Practice your religion, but not in the face of others' religions. And so there's this balance between um, what Shireen called in an earlier session civility as compared to political correctness, which must be, which might mean for you, do you know what I mean? The de denial and keeping repressed what is most important. And, and that's where the rub is do, for me. Do, do you know what I'm saying? It's what, it's what I think we as a country are struggling with. Where is that balance between my right and the rights of others? My right to, uh, to choose my path, whether that's a religion, religious path, right? Um, but, uh, how, but the question is then, um, how do we safeguard my path not colliding with others? Do, and I mean that both nationally and individually. That's my question. Who wants to take that one? <laughs> yeah, I I guess I'll see. see, this this is the kind of the point that I was getting at, is that you really you can't, like as far as expression word, now if we get to violence, we can stop it. Because people can just not become violent towards each other. But when it comes to ideas and conflict of ideas, um, you can't stop it. People will invariably disagree, and the whole point is to understand each other. You don't have to agree. You, you, the, the force that will prevent the violence, the part of the force that prevents the violence, is to understand the other side effectively. I mean, like, really understand. And I think a lot of the times that doesn't happen. 
understand if you know you can understand facts all you want but if you really are trying to learn then you, you have to experience things yes empathy you have to experience it from trying to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and see it and like know what you're, you're going through because that prevents the violence the thing is is that everyone want they want the reward but they don't want to pay the price Everyone wants to be safe and everyone wants to feel free, but nobody wants to pay the price. Nobody wants to step out there and you know be vulnerable and learn something new. But and really, it's, it's impossible. You can't have it both ways. You have to choose. to remember that there's been conflict from day one. Um, we have always had conflict, and part of the reason that this country works in many ways, um, there are many issues that we still have not resolved, but we accept in general that conflict is part of the process. And then there are systems, hopefully, that grow stronger and stronger with time to figure out that conflict. But no right um, exists in pure form. Um, every right has a check, and in general, people are able to um, live out their lives so long as they're not harming someone else. There's general rules like that, um, but the devil's in the details. And I think one thing that we confuse sometimes in this country um, is our like of a certain belief um, with our um, understanding that sometimes we need to live and let live. We may not like every law, and we may not like every belief system, but that's not what this country was founded upon. It was founded upon the freedom for people to live as they wish, believe as they wish, practice as they wish, um, so long as it's not harming someone else. And that's the civility um, that really needs to continue to be talked about because um, there's a way to respectfully disagree, and that's okay. And therein lies, I think, the beauty of a lot of the Constitution. Any other questions? Yeah. So I taught at uh, Jackson College uh, a dozen years ago and then left 10 years ago for a two year stint in, uh, in DC as the director of an organization called the Peace Tax Fund. Um, the Peace Tax Fund, and what this organization was about. Um, I'm interested in your perspective, especially from Dr. Miller and our student in the middle, um, about what I call the free exercise and practice of, of faith. Uh, a lot of times we were representing Quakers, Mennonites, uh, those that had belonged to the historic peace churches that felt like uh, that they weren't allowed to practice um, a Physically, we were given accommodation to, uh, to, to be like Dr. Miller and say I registered physically so that I don't have to participate in war, but uh, my tax dollars are then used for something that I directly oppose. And is there some way that we can uh, to make a law that would allow conscientious objectors funds, tax dollars, to go into something that, um, for anything that the government wants to use other than military use? Organization's been going on for about 40 years uh, since the Vietnam War, and every single session of Congress there's a, a new law passed. But I think there's the summary of maybe it was Alexander Haig, an advisor to, to President Reagan about 1982, and there's lots of uh, protests going on for nuclear weapons. Was uh, I think he summarized it let them march and protest, let them march all they want, as long as they pay their taxes. So I guess my question is, is there a way to, how would you see, again, um, 
or a student in the middle, Dr. Miller, uh, possibly, about how that practice of, of faith uh, might play out in a situation like that. Your, your battle there, and uh, I, I know it's a thrilling uphill one. I would love to see uh, that initiative gain more ground. But one thing I, uh, uh, a lot of my f fellow peace activists of, of many faiths really wish would happen uh, in the U.S. government is that we would form a Department of Peace. I would love for a portion of my taxes, you know, a large chunk goes to the Department of Defense. And the Department of Defense uh, does does a lot of good work, uh, and uh, and there's a lot of waste and a lot of destruction with, with some of those dollars. But if we had a Department of Peace to offset in some way, that actually their their job was to uh, go into places where where there's conflict and uh, use tried and true methods of bringing people together around the table, uh, I I would gladly uh, you know uh, send my tax dollars to that. Just to add on that a little bit, I think what the question you're asking, I think that's just a part of the conflict that might not ever go away. Um, it's something that we, as all people, we all want peace, we all want to be equal with one another, and we need to continue to strive towards that goal, but it's just one of those things that I believe might we might never find a conclusion for. If I could add a couple sentences to that. From an evolutionary perspective, somewhere along the line, me versus you became us versus them. And I think that's where we're stuck. Uh, and what the question you're asking, I think that's just a part of the conflict that might not ever go away. Um, it's something that we, as all as people, we all want peace, we all want to be equal with one another, and we need to continue to strive towards that goal but it's just one of those things that I believe might we might never find a conclusion for. If I could add a couple sentences to that. From an evolutionary perspective, somewhere along the line, me versus you became us versus them. And I think that's where we're stuck uh, in our development. Uh, we, we look around the world and we categorize ourselves into into those categories of us and them. And we are going to have to, if we're going to survive as a species, I think we're going to have to move beyond that and realize that it's just us. There, there is no them. One of my favorite quotes from uh, Mark Twain, and I, I hope he actually said this because I use this all the time, is that underneath our skin, we're all kin. And that, I, to me, that makes uh, so much sense, and it's such a, I think, a, it would be a, a noble target for us. In order to have peace, we need to learn to learn about each other, learn to accept uh, the differences, and to seek out the similarities. And I, I have found as a student of people that we are much more similar across the planet than we are different. Any other questions? I kind of have a question, or kind of a, an idea that I'm not sure if everyone here is aware about, but it seemed like everyone was talking about freedom of speech and how that applies to Americans. No matter who you are, everyone has the same constitutional rights, correct? I mean, everyone's in agreement with that. I guess I have a different take on that, being, um, having been a member of the military for seven years, that is a group that does not have freedom of speech like the rest. And that comes from instructions, it comes from the Uniform Code of Military Justice, that you can be um, reprimanded quite heavily based on putting out political stuff on Facebook. If it says that you are a military member, or there's a picture of you in uniform anywhere on there, and you say, I support 
Hillary Clinton in this election, that simple, or I support Donald Trump in this election, you're wrong. And there are instructions very clear on how to do that. And I'm curious as to if anyone here was aware of that and what your take is on that, and if you think that that is fair, or if it is just being, you know, you saw it's volunteer, you signed up for the military, you know, but you don't get a book when you sign everything that says, you don't get this, you don't get this. It's kind of learned as you go along. So I'm curious to know your guys' take on that and see if, um, if that makes sense to you guys or if you were even aware of that. Because that, that to me, I, I hear First Amendment, uh, First Amendment, freedom of speech, and really the freedom of speech is the only one. Freedom of religion, every, everything else, you are free to do in the military. But if you speak contemptuous words against anyone higher ranking, including the president, no matter how small they might be, you can be in a lot of trouble. And I'm just curious to hear your guys' take on that. Um, I, for one, actually wasn't aware of this, but, um, the more you spoke and the more I thought about this, I suppose I can see a reason as to why this could be a rule, but the oppression of the opinion of our military and our members of the community who help us and protect us is, I can understand how it could be seen as necessary to be bipartisan, but I also think that um, it's it's not right. Um, while you're at work, obviously being nonpartisan, all that is amazing and nice and everything, but you should be able to express your opinion. And um, i just like to thank you for you know informing me of this. And I haven't learned it. I'm not sure how many other people here haven't learned about it, but um, learned something new today. Thank you. I personally would like to say I have heard this things about it from other people, um, not so much in depth, but um, I would also like to thank you for your service, first of all, and um, just, it, I think it's probably one of those things that maybe came up as a thing in order to keep the peace, like, in order, in, within the military, they're trying to keep the peace, so they try to keep people hushed down, and I think that's how it came to be. I don't personally agree with it, but um, I think it's... It just came to be from trying to keep the peace. Again, I'm probably stepping out here on thin ice, uh, talking about discipline that I'm not an expert in. But I do love history, and I've studied it quite a bit, and American history is fascinating to me. And I think probably what you're dealing with is something which is a product from our founding fathers. Uh, they were terrified of a standing military. Um, and they, and they wanted to work very hard in the creation of documents, including the Declaration of the Constitution, that prohibited a standing military from being uh, in existence. That's why we have the Second Amendment and uh, the freedom of people to arm themselves. We didn't want soldiers being, uh, you know, being able to go into people's houses and demand to be fed and demand to be clothed, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this separation that, it, that has existed his, historically in our country has its roots in, in those early years of dealing with the British soldiers in our colonies. Um, and, and as I said before, w although we live in the present, we are very much a product of the forces of the past. And I think that's one of those forces. And quite frankly, I mean, I, I agree with the panelists. I, I thank you for your service to your nation. Uh, but I actually think this is probably a pretty good idea to keep a kind of a separation, if you will, from the political side, from the, the military units of our, of our government. Thank you. Any other questions? Anybody else? All right, well, we can bring this to a close. I want to uh, take this opportunity to thank the members of our panel once again. I really do appreciate your, your time and your energy and your efforts of today. And also, I need to extend a personal note to Donnie Karkek and Marilyn Pryor for their assistance in helping pull this off today. 
And I'd like to thank each, each of you for bothering to, to come today uh, for your respectful attendance and for your civil interaction and your questions. And uh, I'm going to exercise my First Amendment rights, all right? And I'm going to ask God to continue to bless the United States of America. Thank you.